Sin duda alguna, el debate que hoy nos compete es probablemente de los temas más relevantes que hoy por hoy se discuten en la humanidad. Tiene que ver si debemos de ser de alguna u otra forma pesimistas u optimistas con respecto al futuro. Singularity en física es un hoyo negro donde el tiempo se detiene. Y ese concepto ha sido robado, entre comillas, por el mundo de la tecnología, donde de alguna u otra manera nos comparte de que el conocimiento es exponencial, cada 18 meses exponencialmente va creciendo, el costo de la tecnología se va reduciendo. En otras palabras, hoy es tu cumpleaños, si te llega un chip, lo abres y te canta Happy Birthday y lo tiras. Lo que hubiera dado Churchill o Roosevelt o Stalin o Hitler para tener ese chip en esa época. No llevamos probablemente ni 11 o 12 años con Facebook y Twitter. y Las cosas van cambiando rapidísimo. Hoy, hoy, la esperanza de vida de mucha gente que va a nacer en Okinawa, en Palo Alto, en muchas partes del mundo, su esperanza de vida es de 150 años. Hace 100 años, la esperanza de vida era de 40. Hay gente que hoy dice que la gente que nazca en 2074 podrá llegar a vivir 400 años. Obi de Bray dice que mil años. Hoy tienes una, calcula, una calculadora que es una computadora, que es un teléfono, que es todo. Antes era enorme, pronto lo vas a tener en el cerebro. Es más, hay gente que dice que ahora nos vamos a empezar a conectar nuestro cerebro con una nube de computadora para que se nos quede la memoria de todo lo que tenemos allí. Imagínate vivir 400 años. Mucha gente dice, no, ¿qué haría? No, qué horrible. Imagínate llegar con el juez, con tu novia y que te digan, los declaro hasta que la muerte los separe. Mi amor, son 400 años, relájate. ¿no? Se han cambiado las reglas del juego. Pero peor, imagínate que empecemos a crear computadoras que se vuelvan más inteligentes que nosotros y que esas computadoras empiecen a generar otras computadoras ya sin nuestra necesidad y que a lo mejor sean tan inteligentes, tan, 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 tan inteligentes, que eso no es muy lejos, que nos empiecen a manipular o que empiecen a tomar nuestros puestos de trabajo. O por el contrario, computadoras que nos funcionen para que podamos ser más creativos, más felices, las implicaciones de ser humanoides, de tener ojos que empiecen a leer la mente. Ya hay lentes en Google, ahorita hay coches que ya no tienen conductores. Señoras y señores, mientras debatimos la contextualidad, el mundo está avanzando. Y este es el espacio para pensar el presente, que ya es futuro. Y por ello hoy tenemos a los grandes expertos en esta materia, a la gente que ha escrito estos libros de superinteligencia. Y el debate es, ¿nos debemos de preocupar o no nos debemos de preocupar? Hay gente que cree que nos debemos de preocupar. Y los voy a presentar y les voy a decir las reglas del juego. Cada uno de ustedes va a tener cinco minutos, as I told you before, you will have five minutes. To make your statement of purpose. ¿Por qué piensan como piensan? ¿Por qué creen que el futuro que nos espera con la superinteligencia que se puede aproximar va a ser mucho mejor que el presente? ¿Cuáles son las implicaciones en materia de empleo, en materia de máquinas que puedan ser malévolas, en materia de nosotros ser humanoides, en los derechos humanos de los robots, en las emociones? Señoras y señores, en el segundo round van a tener cuatro minutos, cuatro minutos para poder decir cuál es el crimen en contra de la lógica de sus adversarios. Y posteriormente haremos una pregunta a cada uno de ustedes 
sobre las implicaciones de la política pública en la materia. Les pido de favor, primero les presento a los contrincantes, en contra, en contra, viendo un futuro peligroso, preocupante, pesimista, un aplauso para Nick Bostrom. Él es profesor en la Facultad de Filosofía de la Universidad de Oxford y director fundador del Instituto Futuro de la Humanidad. Tiene conocimientos de física, neurociencia, computacional y lógica matemática, así como de filosofía. Fue galardonado con el premio Eugene Ganon e incluido dos veces en el top 100 de pensadores globales de la revista Foreign Policy y en la revista Prospect dentro de la lista mundial de los grandes pensadores de la humanidad. Es autor de 200 publicaciones, incluyendo el libro Superintelligence, Superinteligencia, Caminos, Peligros y Estrategias, el cual se ha convertido en un bestseller del New York Times. Un aplauso para él, por favor. En contra, que también lo conoce, Tyler Cohen, es profesor Harris Goldberg de Economía en la Universidad George Mason. Es autor de El Medicare y El Medicaid, dos programas médicos federales del sistema financiero. Es escritor de importantes libros como The Great Stagnation. Bueno, tiene 19 libros. Es colaborador del New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, entre otros. Y la revista también Foreign Policy lo nombró uno de los 100 mejores pensadores del mundo. Un aplauso también a Tyler Cohen. También en contra del futuro en relación a el peligro de las máquinas, de la inteligencia artificial, las preocupaciones. Martin Ford, fundador de una firma desarrollada de software con sede en Silicon Valley, está graduado como licenciado en Ingeniería Informática por la Universidad de Michigan, Ann Arbor, y en negocios por UCLA. Es autor del auge de los robots, la tecnología y la amenaza de un futuro sin empleo, que se ha convertido en el bestseller del New York Times. Recibió el premio de Financial Times and McKinsey, el libro, libro de negocios del año y fue nombrado como uno de los mejores libros de negocios por Business Leader. También ha colaborado para Fortune, Forbes, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Project Syndicate, The Huffington Post, The Fiscal Times. Has aparecido en NPR, en CNBC. Un aplauso, por favor, a Martin. A favor, donde esperan que el mundo sea mucho más próspero, incluyente, positivo del mundo actual. Gracias sobre todo a la tecnología tenemos a Matt Ridley, que ya ha estado con nosotros, uno de los mejores amigos de las suelas ideas, trabajó como editor de ciencia para The Economist durante nueve años. Actualmente escribe la columna La Mente y la Materia en The Wall Street Journal, además de publicar regularmente para The Times. Escribió El Optimista Racional, Tiene Límites, la Capacidad de Progreso de la Especie Humana, libro donde asume el pesimismo contemporáneo para argumentar que nuestra calidad de vida y la riqueza material seguirán aumentando en el siglo XXI. En su nuevo texto, La Evolución de Todo, Cómo Nacen las Ideas, Mata argumenta que los logros más importantes de la sociedad se desarrollan de abajo hacia arriba. Un aplauso a Matt Ridley. Por cierto, Matt Ridley tiene un libro que les recomiendo que se llama The Red Queen and the Evolution of Sex, donde dice que la monogamia es un invento del hombre. Porque antes los hombres muy poderosos tenían muchas mujeres. Y entonces los hombres sin poder dijeron un hombre, una mujer. Entonces, apláudale a él por ser el creador de la teoría de la monogamia. O, o griten, le hagan lo que quieran. Otra persona a favor, James Arkin. Ron, perdón, Ronald Tarkin. Es profesor regente y decano asociado de investigación en el Colegio de Informática del Instituto de Tecnología de Georgia. Es director del laboratorio Mobile Robot. Desempeñó el cargo de profesor visitante Stint en el Real Instituto de Tecnología de Estocolmo y fue presidente sabático en el Laboratorio Sony de Inteligencia Dinámica de Tokio, en el Grupo de Robótica de Inteligencia Artificial y Laboratorio para el Análisis de Arquitectura de Sistemas en el Centro Francés Nacional para la Investigación Científica de Toulouse. Entre sus libros publicados incluyen Robótica basada en el comportamiento, colonias de robot y rector del comportamiento letal en robots autónomos. Señoras y señores, un aplauso a Ronald Arkin.
También a favor, James Besson, es profesor de Derecho en la Escuela de Leyes de la Universidad de Boston, donde dirige un proyecto de investigación que estudia el impacto de las nuevas tecnologías en la inteligencia artificial sobre la fuerza del trabajo y las medidas normativas. Escribió el libro Learning by Doing, The Real Connection Between Innovation, Wages and Wealth, en el que analiza la historia para entender cómo las nuevas tecnologías actuales afectarán los salarios y las habilidades de los empleos. Esta investigación se incluyó en el libro La Falta de Patentes del Futuro, cómo los jueces, los burócratas y los abogados tienen problemas con el riesgo de la innovación. Desarrolló el primer programa de edición para PC y el éxito comercial, lo que ves, lo que hay. ¡Un aplauso! Sin más preámbulos, vamos al primer round. Golpe al cerebelo. Cuatro minutos, cinco minutos, five minutes donde cada uno de ustedes tendrá para comentar su posición sobre el tema. A favor, Ronald Arkin, you have the podium. Hola, uh, buenos días uh, y viva México. Uh, uh, yo, no puedo, yo no puedo hablar español bien, uh, perdóname. Uh, so I will be speaking in English uh, today. Um, artificial intelligence and its role in autonomous systems have promised everything from utopian freedom to existential dystopia. The unfilled hyperbole surrounding past and present promises and perils regarding AI futures has left many people skeptical, afraid, or just confused. Rational discussion is often left in the wake due to the fears and fantasy evoked by the press and Hollywood, and yes, even scientists. Fortunately, as a byproduct, this has resulted in a blossoming of worldwide discourse on the ethical implications of the intelligent machines we are discussing and creating. Many near and, uh, and mid-term ethical concerns have arisen with the advent of autonomous systems, particularly regarding driverless cars, privacy and drones, companion and intimate robotics, the displacement of jobs by intelligent machines, and war-fighting robots, among others. The IEEE Global Initiative on the Ethics of Autonomous Systems, the United Nations, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the White House, and the Future of Life Institute are among many responsible organizations that are now considering the ramifications of the real-world consequences of machine autonomy as we continue to stumble and try and find a way forward. But I am confident that we can find a way forward if we do so with care and reason and not fear and trepidation. History can teach us how to and how not to address technological change, such as job loss, that will potentially affect us. I am not concerned about the posited existential threats to humanity from artificial intelligence and the associated apocalypse. The sky is not falling. We will have more than ample opportunity to destroy ourselves by other means prior to the singularity, should it ever occur. While I'm glad smart people are thinking about it, The present holds far more perils to humanity, in my mind, than this futuristic, hypothetical fear. Discussions on these doomsday scenarios distract us from the more pressing tasks at hand in securing a future we truly want. One thing can clearly be stated. We are creating autonomous technology faster than we are able to, one, understand its implications, two, interpret it within moral frameworks, and three, create policy and legislation to govern its development and deployment. Progress in, AI, progress in AI, despite a rather slow pace for decades, finally appears to be accelerating, as evidenced by advances in machine learning, such as Google's AlphaGo, cognitive computing, such as IBM's Watson, robotics, such as Boston Dynamics' Minispot and Atlas, speech understanding, such as Apple's Siri, Amazon Echo's Alexa and Google Home, and the list goes on. While we are now in a catch-up phase, regarding regulation and legislation, society and governments need to be far more proactive and must discuss and debate the difficult questions surrounding the use of artificial intelligence. If we ignore the rapid pace of advances, we do so at our own peril, at the very fabric, uh, as the very fabric of our own society and international relations will be tested at the very least and possibly ruptured in unpredictable ways at the worst. So what now? I try not to be too prescriptive in my discussion of these issues. It is not the place for a roboticist to tell the world what is right and wrong, nor scare it into submission. 
It is my place, however, to state that there are pressing ethical quandaries that need to be discussed. We need not be fearful, but we need to be proactive in understanding the societal impact of this technology before policy generation and legislations. As examples, we are already well engaged in proactive discussions regarding lethal autonomous weapons. For driverless cars, the ethical discussion is concurrent with the introduction of the technology into the marketplace, with uncertain results regarding liability and responsibility. With respect to intimate robotics, we are not really engaged at all in the necessary ethical discussions that will guide our acceptance or rejection of the technology. It is up to all of us to secure a reasonable future for ourselves, our families, our society, and the world. Technologies need to engage in these discussions and be circumspect on the technology they are creating. Proactive discussion is essential, but not based on fear or doomsday scenarios. Let us begin today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation to come here. I think um, it's important if we're going to have a discussion on uh, AI to try to be a little bit clear about what we mean by AI. I think there are several different contexts um, that are very distinct, each a legitimate uh, topic for conversation, but different. Um, AI used to be, in the uh, 60s and 70s, about building expert systems. So you would have human experts that would handcraft knowledge tokens and put them in a big database, and you could make some simple logical derivations. And these systems didn't scale. They were very brittle. Uh, today, the cutting edge of AI is about machine learning. So it's about crafting algorithms uh, that can learn from experience in the same way that we humans learn, from raw perceptual data and build up representations and find patterns in data. So one context is this near-term context. What will these exciting advances that we see in machine learning with deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, what will they enable us to do? And there, I think, the picture looks very bright, very positive. There are a number of exciting applications in medical diagnosis. You can take a picture of a mole you have, and it tells you whether it looks like it might be cancerous or not. Uh, better recommender systems so that you can find the books or movies uh, that, that you really will enjoy watching, video games, self-driving cars are in development, uh, behind the scenes improvements in logistic systems, all of that I think is just overwhelmingly positive. A different context is a little bit further down the road. We have the medium term context where machines become capable enough to really begin to substitute for human labor in a wide variety of areas. There, we confront some more significant issues. There is greater potential for social transformation in this medium term. We might have to start to think about the use of AI to develop autonomous weapon systems uh, that can take robotic warfare to another level. The use uh, in security and surveillance that makes it possible to, to monitor populations, maybe with uh, undesirable applications in authoritarian regimes, which might be able to crack down on opposition in much more effective ways than have proved possible uh, in the past, and impacts on the labor market with potential for unemployment. Um, but in this medium context too, I think the broad story is positive. Yes, there will be these things to look out for, but broadly speaking, I expect the impact to be very, very positive in the medium term. You could say that the goal is full unemployment. We really want to create machines that can do all that we can do, so that we don't have to do that. That's, that's the purpose of having technology in the first place, to be able to do more with less, with less human input. And yes, there will then have to be socioeconomic adjustments so that people who, who lose their jobs still have a source of income. Um, there will have to be cultural adjustments so that people find meaning in existence, even if they don't have, uh, uh, have to go to work every day to earn a wage check. I, I think those are big challenges, but challenges that we ultimately can confront and solve. And there would be enormous economic growth if this comes to pass. Uh, but then there is 
a long-term context as well. And, and that's really where most of, of the work that I have been doing with colleagues has been centered. And this is the context that arises if AI one day were to succeed at its original mission, which has all along been to create true general intelligence. Intelligence that is not just good at specific tasks, but it can do everything that we humans can do. And I believe that if that one day uh, is achieved, then superintelligence will not be uh, far uh, along after that. It, it's not going to be that we get to human level machine intelligence and stop there. If we get to that level, we will soon have machine superintelligence. And there, I think there are some significant uh, risks, including existential risks. Um, we don't yet know how you would be able to uh, engineer something that was radically smarter than humans and such that it would still be under human control, that it will do what we uh, intend for it to do. And, and that's a big open research area. And I'm, I think that could go either way. If we get our act together, we do the basic research. By the time we figure out how to make machines really smart, we will hopefully have found a solution to this control problem. But that's not a given. That's something that will happen, I think, only if we actually do our homework on that. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to focus just on the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, so we have these dramatic new technologies that can take over and do tasks that humans do. And that is going to lead to a shakeup in the labor market. It, it, it is going to lead to a loss of jobs in some occupations. But I don't think it's going to lead to mass unemployment because it's also going to create jobs. Uh, that does raise a different problem, though. Uh, when we create new jobs, involving new technology, we also create a need for, for workers who have new skills. Uh, we're facing, and we've been experiencing so far, significant difficulty in developing those skills in the workplace. place. Uh, this, though, I think is the real challenge that AI poses over the next 10 or 20 years. The issue isn't jobs, the issue is skills. So why am I confident in saying that? Uh, we can think about, th the best evidence we have for thinking about the next 10 or 20 years, it's what's been happening in the last 10 or 20 years. Because in fact, AI has been in the marketplace for three decades. In the 1980s, applications were commercialized using AI. And if we speak about computer automation more generally, uh, computer auto uh, computers have been used to automate tasks in all sorts of jobs. In the US, uh, it was 1997 when the majority of workers first had used computers to automate some tasks in their jobs. So we can look at how specific applications of AI or computer automation more generally have affected employment, and we find a very different picture than what you would expect. So my, my favorite example is the bank teller and the automated teller machine. Uh, these, the ATM machine came along and people predicted that hundreds of thousands of bank tellers would be out of work. What we saw in the U.S. was the, something different. The actual number of bank tellers grew during the entire period that the number of ATM machines was growing. We have other applications. AI was used in uh, making loan decisions, in financial trading, yet we've seen growth in the number of bank loan officers a bank, number of financial managers. Uh, AI has been shown to do a better job at uh, scouring legal documents and litigation than humans do. Uh, but we've actually seen growth in the number of paralegals and, and lawyers uh, over the same period. These aren't just some fortuitous examples. My research, I, I've researched this looking at all detailed occupations. And what we find is that on average, if an occupation is using computers to automate some tasks, employment in that occupation actually goes up. Now that may seem ridiculous, um, but there's a very good reason. It's, what happens is, uh, we have to remember that automation uh, does more than just eliminate labor, it also reduces costs, it may improve quality, it may produce new kinds of products, and what happens when, with that is that consumer demand increases. So if you look, for instance, at the bank tellers, um, banks founded that they could operate a bank branch with fewer tellers, 
Uh, they therefore opened up many more bank branches, which offset the otherwise loss of jobs. So the com consumer demand matters. Um, this isn't an entirely happy story, however. Um, there are jobs being lost. Uh, we, we've seen jobs like telephone operators go away or typesetters. The main thing that seems to happen here is with, with regarding automation is that humans using computers become very productive. In fact, they become so productive that they take jobs away from other occupations. So we have graphic designers who came along and took over the work of typesetters. So it's a very different story, though. It's a story where it's not machines replacing the humans, it's other humans who use machines replacing human jobs. And this is a problem because it means we may have uh, people thrown out of work who don't have the skills to get the new jobs that are being created. Uh, we may have people being thrown out of work who tend to be poor. It increases economic inequality. But this, though, I think is the real challenge, not mass unemployment, but uh, the challenge of building a, a workforce that has the skills and the knowledge and the experience to really utilize uh, these new technologies to their fullest, which will also create the gener greatest productivity and, and output and sharing uh, shared wealth. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, first, I want to begin by uh, distinguishing between two kinds of artificial intelligence. And Nick talked a bit about this earlier, but a lot of people are concerned about very futuristic science fiction AI and how it might destroy us all or take over. I, I think perhaps that's a legitimate concern for the far future. But for right now, what I really want to focus on and what I'm very concerned on is the disruption that I think is very likely to unfold over the next 10 to 20 years. And I think it's a disruption that could end up putting a tremendous amount of stress both on society and on the economy. And the basic idea here, of course, is that the machines are increasingly going to substitute for human labor. And that disruption is not something that we should take lightly. Uh, I think that if you look at what happened in the United States just a short while ago in our uh, election, you understand what it can mean when people feel economic stress, when they feel that they're being left behind. Now, the, the technology that is truly central to this and which is accelerating at a very rapid rate is machine learning and increasingly deep learning. These are very powerful, scalable, broadly applicable technologies and they're gonna have an enormous impact. And I think that what it really leads to is a world where almost any kind of work that is on some level routine and predictable is gonna be highly susceptible to automation. Now, you can kind of visualize the impact of that by imagine some random worker out there in the economy and ask yourself, for this typical worker doing this typical job, is it possible that another smart person, if they had access to a very detailed historical record of everything this worker has done in the past, could that other person study this record and eventually learn to do that job? Or perhaps could another person just watch this worker at work and, and learn to do that job? And you know what, if the answer to that is yes, then I think it's a very good bet that eventually there'll be a smart algorithm or a robot that will come along and likewise learn to do that job. And that really gives you a sense of just how many jobs potentially there are out there that might be susceptible to this. By some estimates, it might be anything from 30% to 50% or even more of the jobs out there that could be automated. And obviously, if that were to happen, that would be a staggering impact on our society. Just to give one example, think about the impact of self-driving vehicles, cars, and also trucks. You know that in many countries and many states in the US, driving a vehicle of some kind is actually the most common occupation there is. So if just that one particular example results in a staggering impact. And of course, it's not gonna be just that one place. And the most important thing to understand is it's also not just about blue collar or low skill jobs. One of the things that we're seeing is that these technologies are very aggressively climbing the skills ladder. We've now got algorithms that can do basic journalism. You see systems that can tap into a data stream, they can analyze that, and based on that, they can write a news story. By one account in the US and around the world, there is every 30 seconds or so, a machine-generated news story published on the internet or perhaps in a newspaper, and you can read one of those stories, and it's not at all obvious that it was written by 
a computer and not by a human being. So that sort of gives you an example of how even more skilled jobs are very likely to be impacted in the near future. And that, I think, will eventually undermine our very conventional way of thinking about this, which is that education and training is always the solution. If a machine comes along and automates your lower wage, blue collar job, then what we should do, of course, is send you back to school, give you some more training, give you some more education, and then you can move up that skills ladder and hopefully take on something that's more sophisticated, something that uses your brain now. But the problem we have now is that the machines are moving into that domain. The machines are taking on cognitive capability. They're making decisions, they're solving problems, and again, most importantly, they're beginning to learn. And that's just going to be an enormously disruptive technology that's going to scale across a great many jobs. And I really think we're going to have to start to think outside the box about how we're going to solve this. If we don't do that, we're going to run into big problems. So my, to the extent that I'm pessimist about, or pessimistic about this, it's not so much that I am against the technology, because I'm not. I think that the technology uh, is a positive thing. It will bring with it many positive benefits. I don't think that we could stop it, even if we tried to. But I am pessimistic about our ability as human beings to successfully adapt to this. I think that it would be a huge mistake to underestimate what we're going to face in terms of these challenges, in terms of solving this problem of the distribution of income, in terms of finding a way to make sure that a very substantial percentage of our population is not left behind. Because if they are left behind, we're going to have political and economic upheaval. And that can lead to some very bad things. Thank you. Buenos dias. My opponents here are very reasonable people and they've raised very reasonable concerns. But out there, there are people who are talking about artificial intelligence today as if it is an apocalyptic threat to the future of the human race. And this stands in a long tradition of apocalyptic threats uh, about what's going to happen to us in the future. And they've nearly always been wrong in that respect. So in the 1960s, chemical technology was going to shorten our lives. In the 1970s, reproductive technology was going to cause disastrous results. In the 1980s, biotechnology was going to be catastrophic. In the 1990s, nanotechnology was going to hurt us. And to, to cap it all on the 31st of December 1999, because the computers couldn't cope with the change of date, civilization was going to come to a grinding halt. And none of those things happened. All of those technologies were good, not bad. If you go Go back to 1949, you find Norbert Wiener, the inventor of cybernetics, saying that the advent of computers in manufacturing is going to produce an industrial revolution of unmitigated cruelty. It didn't happen, quite the reverse. In 1964, a blue ribbon, ribbon panel looked into the effect of automation and said that the potentially unlimited output by systems of machines will require little cooperation from humans, and this is going to be disastrous in the short term. It didn't happen. Instead, what's happened in the last 50 years? In my lifetime, the number of people living in extreme poverty on the planet has gone from three quarters to less than 10%. The average income of the average person has trebled. Child mortality is down by two thirds. The world has become more equal, not less, because people in poor countries have got rich faster than people in rich countries. And if you go back even further, go back to the 1830s, the first wave of automation when, when threshing machines did people out of jobs on farms and there were protests led by a mysterious chap called Captain Swing in England. Did that lead to, at that stage, 95% of the world worked in farming. And if they didn't, we would starve. Now, just a few percent work in farming in many countries. Did, did that result in mass unemployment? No, because they got jobs in manufacturing. Uh, then manufacturing became automated. Did that result in mass unemployment? No, a lot of people moved into services. What's different this time? Well, I'll tell you what's different. It's people like us who are threatened. It's academics and journalists. Suddenly, we're really concerned about this wave of automation because it's going gonna, it's gonna to teach students and write articles, the things that, that we do. Uh, and suddenly, we're more worried about it. And of course, what happens with technology uh, is that it, uh, it fulfills other needs. It creates, it complements human work. It creates new opportunities for, for work as well. And just think about what's happening here today with all of us in this room. We could probably do all this online. All of you could be at home, we could be at home, we could do the whole thing with, with technology, but we're not doing that. Why? Because actually there's been a growth in live events. There's a huge resurgence in interest in live events. 
that's not because of technology, it's despite technology. So uh, the idea that, that artificial intelligence is going to suddenly uh, take away all opportunities for us to do things like this is clearly not right. But I'd like you to cast your minds forward and imagine that, suppose it does happen that one day there is a technology so powerful that it can fulfill literally any need you can think of instantaneously at zero cost. So that I could say, Hal, take me to Mars tomorrow and on the way rewrite Shakespeare in rap. Okay? I hadn't thought of that until a minute ago, but that's what I wanted to do. And it can do that. In that world, in that world, even if this did, does happen, what's the problem? Suddenly we can fulfill all our needs. We don't need to go to work, but at the moment we don't spend an awful lot of our life working. We spend a lot of it consuming. As Adam Smith said, the whole point of production is consumption. Uh, as David Orter has written, if human labor is rendered superfluous by automation, then the chief economic problem is not scarcity, but distribution. And if you look in the UK in 1960, 12% of, of your lifetime was spent in work, at work. Now it's 9%. Just that's, that's how much time we spend at work. The rest is spent in education, in retirement, on holiday, at the weekends, uh, these kind of things. Consuming, and consume, consumption is the, is the purpose of production. So I suggest to you that artificial intelligence is just another wave of innovation that will help humanity fulfill its needs and improve its living standards uh, and not drive us into Armageddon. Herbert Simon, in the 1960s, said that we're worrying about the wrong things if we're worrying about this. And in the days of Donald Trump, I think he'd be right to say that again. These three gentlemen here, you know what I call them? I call them Los Curanderos because they think they know how to fix the patient and it's with artificial intelligence. But, like the curanderos, they need to be much more worried. Let me give you some core reasons why it's not going to be as easy as they're telling you. First, the loss of jobs. We all know this is coming, we see it coming, they admit it's coming. And you say, well, everyone will adjust. But let's do a simple history lesson. We're here in Mexico, so let's look at the agricultural revolution in Mexican history. Most of Mexican history, agricultural production was highly decentralized. Families on their own growing corn without machines, right? The agricultural revolution comes to Mexico and it no longer makes economic sense for families on their own to grow corn not using machines. These gentlemen are telling you everyone will adjust. Simple question, Mexico today, visit the Nahuas, visit the Mayas, here in the state of Puebla, visit the Otomi. How many Mexicans today are still growing corn on family plots without machines and using burros? A large number. If you think of, you know, the government of Porfirio Diaz, it ends in 1911. At that point, Mexico has some infrastructure. That kind of home production doesn't make sense. Over a hundred years, the adjustment has been quite slow. The most striking thing about these three presentations, as far as I can recall, not one of those gentlemen ever once used the word culture or the word ethics. And we need to think about this very carefully because culture and ethics and not always machines will be the main issues looking forward. Let's think about what else artificial intelligence will enable us to do. If you have an iPhone, every text you send, anything you do on the network, who will be able to read it? Senior Trump. This might work out okay. Maybe he's not interested. But surely we should worry about this prospect, no mention of it from this side. Facial recognition. To have a camera, it scans your face, you're walking in public places, you enter the store. They can tell it's you. This is starting now, it will be the case on a larger scale in less than 10 years. So in our lives, not only through Facebook, 
but it is tracked where you go with your smartphone. The government has access to this. Every time you enter a store, there are closed circuit television cameras all over Matt Ridley's Great Britain, and they now can recognize all of our faces. And it's artificial intelligence that's doing that. I'm not saying there's no upside. I'm saying we should be deeply worried. And the fact that they didn't bring up these issues actually makes me more worried. Also, look at human history. Every time there's a new technology, like with industrialization, some country, some bad leader, thinks he can win a war with it. Will that happen with artificial intelligence? We genuinely don't know. It's hard to predict. Again, this is a worry. How about using drones as assassins? Try a rerun of Mexico's current drug wars, where you don't have to show up in person to knock someone off with a pistol but you send a drone to do your bidding for you. What will that be like? Again, we don't know. I'm not trying to predict this. I'm saying that here, you know, the Otomi, they do divination with corn. The Nahuas, divination with corn. They're doing divination, but without corn. And they don't know. I'm telling you, worry just a bit more. Also, artificial intelligence. One of the things on the way, I'm not sure, how far away it is, but the ability to do things with robots that maybe one would not discuss in polite company. There are a number of Mexican slang words I've heard. Uh, I believe I'm not allowed to say them on Mexican TV, but perhaps a few of you know these words. Imagine doing that with a robot. How will that work out for family structure, for dating, for relationships? Again, it's difficult to predict I would stress we're entering a new and very tricky area. You have three men here trying to tell you everything is fine, and they absolutely have not yet made their case. Thank you. Bravo. Wow. Les voy a pedir a la producción si abren, ponen la luz, iluminan un poquito el escenario en lo que mueven esto rapidísimo para ir a la siguiente parte. Ahora que ya tienen alguna visión de lo que es este debate y la importancia del mismo, les pediría, porque haremos lo mismo al final del debate, ¿quién de ustedes cree, en promedio, de que lo que viene con la inteligencia artificial, y sobre todo que no lo hemos tocado con la superinteligencia, nos va a traer un mundo mucho mejor? Que levante la mano. Ok, ¿quién cree, por el contrario, que el mundo que viene y que se avecina con los avances de los humanoides, de la superinteligencia, es realmente mucho más peligroso, tanto cultural como tecnológicamente. Pues está casi, casi a la mitad del de este. Señoras y señores, a ver si después llega alguien de ustedes a cambiar de opinión. El siguiente punto es, each of you will have just four minutes to check and find if there was crime against logic of what the opponents have said. Vamos a ver en los próximos cuatro minutos. Cada uno de ustedes podrá dirigirse a cualquiera o a todos para decir dónde está el crimen en contra de la lógica de los argumentos. El propósito es empoderar la mente humana haciendo preguntas relevantes. Now we will start with you, Nick. What's the crime against logic of the opposition? Four minutes. Yes. Um... Well, I think we, we find that the issue is, is, is complex and falls into a lot of different propositions that really need to be evaluated on their individual basis. Um, I think that the question of employment, if we zoom in on that, uh, depends on many factors, including the time scale that we're talking about. It is, the case historically that technology has been a complement to human labor. The value of one hour of human labor has increased because there are now machines that the laborer can use that makes the labor more productive. You could imagine a different regime where uh, technology becomes a net substitute for human labor. This is perhaps easiest to imagine if we think of the limiting case where machines can do everything that humans can do, but do so more cheaply. Um, in that case, the demand for human labor, one might expect, would go down. Um, so one question we face is, on net, 
over some time scale, will technology be a substitute or a complement to human labor? Um, and I think these time scales uh, are just very uncertain. We just don't know how that will play out. Um, but I think it is important to appreciate that to a first order approximation, the idea that you could have a machine that is able to do all that a human can do and that therefore displaces the human worker is prima facie a very good thing. Um, because you can then produce more stuff with less effort. Now, there might then be ripple effects and consequences for the socioeconomic order, which you would have to address. Uh, but, but before turning to those possible negative consequences, we should at least first pause to appreciate that there is just a lot of work that needs to be done in, in the world, and, and there is a lot of grind and unpleasant business that humans now have to spend their valuable hours doing. Um, and if some of that could be handed over to machines, it is a potentially very positive thing. Um, you might wonder what would people be doing in, in a world if they didn't have to work. And then there really are sort of two challenges that you would then have to confront. A, they would have to have a source of income. So there would have to be some ways by which, uh, even while not working, you could still earn enough money to have a happy life. That could be either by having ownership in some slice of the capital in society or by having governments doing some redistribution. Um, the other part is the cultural part, like what would you do with your time? Because for, for many people today, work is not just a source of income, but it's a source of meaning, of, of worth. And, and you find that when people get unemployed, in, in rich countries, they still have enough to eat, they, they get unemployment benefits, but they often get depressed and the relationships break down and they spiral down. And, and that's because we, we see our self-worth connected to this idea that you're a wage earner. But that, that would have to change. And we can look at historical examples of that. I think there have been, say, for most of human history, the high status desirable condition was not to have to work. You were an aristocrat. You had enough. You didn't have to sell your labor. And many aristocrats seem to have had worthwhile lives. Um, children don't contribute anything productively um, to society. They seem to have fun and worthwhile lives. Uh, but I do think that that would be this significant cultural change. Our whole education system, our whole attitude would have to move away from this idea that, that, that the purpose in life is to you know, commute into the, the office and sit in front of a screen to get a paycheck. Thank you. First, I want to speak to my colleague uh, over there. I don't fully understand the Mexican word uh, that he used to describe me, uh, but I would contend uh, that he has issues himself. Uh, one of the most fundamental is either deafness or a inability to listen. I've been married 42 years. Uh, my wife has taught me how to listen, probably not as well as I should. Here's my opening statement. See the word ethics in, circled four times at least uh, on that as well. <laughs> Second, if you could read as opposed to listen, uh, I think you may find uh, that it is laced deeply uh, with concerns uh, about the future. But enough of that. Nick, I want to turn to you. The singularity. Let's talk about superintelligence. To me, superintelligence is a red herring. It, plain and simple. It's, dis it's taking us away, it's distracting us from the current things we should be worried about with artificial intelligence. It is a, those, we have those concerns, but superintelligence, this apocalyptic vision, which uh, my colleague over here articulated quite well, where in one of your examples, where the entire universe may be turned into paper clips, uh, is, that's kind of strange, but uh, an interesting perspective. The notion of runaway, uh, or I forget how you put it, the kinetic takeoff, I guess, is described, uh, is a potential existential threat, but so is an alien invasion. So are asteroids. So are plagues that may be coming. And if, you want, if I want to be concerned about something that has the potential to destroy humanity, I would be more concerned with, for those of you in, in biology, you might have heard about CRISPR and gene editing that's going on right now and the potential ways we can maybe create 
superhumans. Forget the machines. We can create superhumans that do things and create rifts in our society uh, and structures in terms of maybe super intelligence in people. Forget the machine. That could entirely happen uh, as well. So even if the singularity is possible, let's assume that it is. Suppose that we can create machines that are smarter, better uh, than human beings. And you speak to this a little in your writing, but the notion of super morality. I've often argued that these machines will actually, if they're super intelligent, they will potentially be super moral. And yes, we can debate the point as to will they have the same ethics as we do? Uh, will they just want to keep us around as pets, as uh, John McCarthy uh, described uh, uh, many years ago? But maybe they would view that as fratricide or matricide if they started killing off human beings uh, with some respect. And if you're really intelligent, is that the sort of thing that uh, you would want to do? Yes, we can. We can hypothesize and manufacture fears uh, that will distract us from what we really need to focus as this technology moves forward, which is issues such as self-driving cars, which my other colleague, uh, uh, opponent, excuse me, uh, brought up over there, but he's a colleague too. Um, one of the things is, yeah, they will put people out of jobs, but they will potentially save lives. People will be removed, which are the most dangerous thing on the highways. People kill people on the roads because they are drunk, because they are distracted, because they get angry for all these different reasons. And if we can succeed with the deployment of artificial intelligence, maybe we can find ways to adapt. And I'm not so quick to write off adaptation uh, as a mechanism because humans are incredibly adaptive. Uh, we find ways to be able to accommodate these sorts of things. Um, deep learning, another issue I can speak about maybe in the next session, but that's an old technology, oddly enough, that started with Fukushima's neocognitron and just computing power has made it uh, come forward. There's a variety of different things, but uh, for now, uh, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Wow. Thanks. I want to uh, go back and talk a bit about a point that was raised by Matt on the other side here correctly, and that is that these technological disruptions have, of course, occurred in the past. Uh, as Matt said, it used to be that most people worked on farms. Now employment in the agricultural sector is perhaps 1% to 2% in advanced countries. Uh, so what has happened is that tractors and combines and all the other machinery came in and disrupted agriculture eliminated millions of jobs. People then moved to manufacturing. Later on, manufacturing, of course, automated and offshored, and then people moved to the service sector, and that's where most people now work in, in most advanced economies. But here's the important thing to understand. When people were working on the farm, they were doing routine work. When they moved to the assembly line in factories, they were doing routine work. And for the most part, when they moved to the service sector, and now they're working at Walmart, scanning barcodes, they're doing routine work. We're now entering an age where all of that routine work is going to be threatened. It's largely going to disappear. And so the transition that workers are going to have to go through in order to remain relevant is going to be entirely different. It's not going to be moving to some new sector and doing another form of routine work, perhaps after a bit of training and education, because there is going to be no new sector and there's going to be no new routine work. They're going to have to instead attempt to do something fundamentally non-routine and creative. And some people, of course, will make that transition, but again, many people will be left behind. So there is this ongoing process of creative destruction. We are going to create new jobs in the future, but those jobs are going to be entirely different in nature than the bulk of the jobs that now support most of our population. And the question is, are there going to be enough jobs created? And I think the answer to that could well be no. And secondly, Will the jobs that are created be a good match for the people that need them? I think we could very well end up into a, with a significant skill mismatch issue. You know, one thing that you will hear people like those on the other side say is that, well, it's certainly true that lots of jobs that exist today will disappear, but there will be new things in the future. There'll be things in the future that we can't even imagine. And you know, it's true. You can think back to the year 1900. There would have been someone who had a job shoveling coal into a steam engine. Now, that person would perhaps have not been able to imagine that today that job would be completely gone and now there's a job working at Mar Walmart scanning barcodes. But the thing to understand, again, about both of those jobs is that they're, they're fundamentally routine and all of those kinds of jobs are going to disappear. 
So we really need to think about the challenge of what we're going to do with people that perhaps aren't equipped to move in to the new kinds of creative jobs or jobs that are in some way uh, protected from automation because there's, there simply will be a very significant mismatch there. So I personally think that this is just going to be an enormous challenge. And, I, and it's, again, none of this is to take away from the positive sides. As was pointed out, self-driving cars will potentially save millions of lives. That doesn't mean we should stop the advent of, of self-driving cars. Of course, we shouldn't trade lives for jobs, but we have to understand the impact of potentially millions of jobs disappearing for people that it may simply not be easy to transition them into something more creative. So again, I think that the, the most important point here is that we should not underestimate the extent of the disruption and the challenge. As you know, people are adaptable, but our political systems, our institutions are much less so. It, you know, it takes a lot longer to address many of these issues. And among the issues that we're going to have to address, I think most importantly is the issue of income distribution. And that is among the hardest things to address politically. In fact, the very word redistribution is, in the United States at least, almost completely politically toxic. You can't utter it. So don't underestimate what we face. So I certainly share some of the concerns that Tyler brought up and that Ron has brought up in the past. Uh, but I was focusing my comments strictly on this question of mass unemployment, which has been our focal, our focal debate question. And in fact, Tyler, if you had listened, I had said that we will face a lot of disruption, but the, the, the challenge we face is not mass net unemployment, but transitioning people from one set of jobs to another. Martin argues that, well, we're just going to see jobs disappear and routine, routine jobs disappear. Um, we've been seeing routine jobs disappear forever. Computer automation has been making routine jobs go away. But in fact, where computers are being used, they're actually increasing employment, even in routine jobs. That's what we're seeing today. Um, the, the reason for this is maybe a little complicated and not obvious. Yes, it's true that machine learning uh, is a form of learning and lets machines do things like that humans do by, by learning. But machine learning is a very limited sort of learning. It can only learn certain things, at, at least in terms of where the technology is today and where it's likely to be in the next 10 or 20 years. Machine learning, for instance, takes a huge amount of data. Machine learning can't take, uh, hu humans on the other hand can learn from a very small amount of data. Uh, and, and the technology, the artificial intelligence technology, hasn't been able to deal with a problem like that. The, there are a number of other limitations where machine learning, it, it can solve certain problems very well, but it doesn't solve all problems. This is very significant, because even if you have a job that is so-called routine, and some tasks can be done very well by a computer, they will be done by a computer. But as long as there are some tasks that can't be done, uh, which is the case, and, and I expect to be the case for the next 10 or 20 years, for most occupations, uh, we have a different story. Um, very rarely has automation completely automated a job. We're going to see some of those coming up. Perhaps there's, for instance, some driving jobs that are going to get completely automated. But in fact, historically, even though there's been huge amounts of automation, uh, very rarely is it a complete automation. This turns out to be very significant for the following reason. Even if we automate most things, those demand effects kick in and can create an increase in jobs. So I can give you a very specific example. In the 19th century in the United States, weaving technology automated 98% of the work. Of, it took a weaver to weave a, a, a yard of cloth. Yet the number of weaving jobs increased because the, the price of cloth dropped, demand increased, and there was, there was great growth. Now, weaving is a routine job, and most of the routine tasks were automated. But though that 2% that wasn't automated uh, turned out to be significant to, to propel a huge amount of job growth. This is the same sort of thing we're going to see, perhaps challenged a bit more, but it's the same sort of thing we're going to see over the next 10 or 20 years. And for this reason, I don't really 
think we're going to see this scenario Martin paints. It's going to be, it's going to be a very disruptive scenario. It's going to be a scenario where people have to learn new skills, and it's not just a simple matter of education. It's a matter of, 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 of you know, learning through experience on the job and, and this sort of thing, which is often very difficult. But it's nevertheless a real and very disruptive challenge, one which will create social unrest of sorts. Uh, and one that we need to think about. But the, the key idea here is we need to focus on the right po problem. If the, the problem is generating those skills, it's not mass unemployment. And that, that's what I wanted to focus on. Me? Let's take a very concrete question. We're here in Puebla, there's a Ford plant, other forms of automobile production. Imagine that 10 years from now, automation and artificial intelligence had advanced to the point where 95% of those jobs were done by machines. Can you imagine this working out better for the state and city of Puebla? I think we can be genuinely uncertain about the answer to that question. But all of you who, who know Puebla best, just try to gauge your first reaction to that question. All of those jobs, those middle class jobs, the foundation of the economy, society, polity here, they're all automated. That will mean some technical advances. It will raise the return to capitalists, some real upsides. But do you have more of a positive or negative feeling about that development? And keep in mind, every economist I know believes that artificial intelligence will increase income inequality. Again, ask yourself a simple question about my country, United States, your country, Mexico. Do we need an additional increase in income inequality? And there will be offsetting benefits. But when you pose it this way, I don't think the statement, we should be optimistic, is exactly warranted. I think we should be cautious. And let me return to this key issue of ethics. My friend, the robot scientist, he did mention ethics in his talk. He talked about ethical concerns and ethical quandaries. So he raised problems. He never said, I believe today that we have the social and ethical capital to handle these issues. I don't think I've heard anyone on this side of the room say that. And again, I wish to be modest here with respect to prediction. There's an old American saying, prediction is hard, especially when it concerns the future. <laughs> but again, go back to the issue of, say, doing something intimate with an artificial intelligence robot. Are today's family ethics, relationship ethics, so strong that this will not be a major problem for many relationships? We already see, in so many cases, a simple technology, pornography online. Actually, you find it using search, using artificial intelligence. That's already a problem for many romantic relationships in society today. And this could get much worse. So again, the emphasis upon thinking, what are our cultural values today? How robust are they? Matt Ridley has referred us to the past. The world has never ended. Yes, the, the world's not going to end now. But look back to past episodes, the Industrial Revolution or the Mechanization Revolution of the early 20th century that preceded the two world wars. They changed so many things. They led to incredible good, but also incredible bad, like the Holocaust, the murders of Joseph Stalin. So the past pattern we see is you get big advances, but human beings typically do not have the ethical and social capital to handle those advances very immediately, and we make big, big, significant, long-lasting mistakes. My best bet is that could come this time around. I would stress we genuinely don't know, but are we likely to make better decisions by being the optimists or by being a little more pessimistic on this? In this way, I'm actually going to side with the pessimists. Thank you. Tyler says we don't know about the future. Um, and he's right. There was a British footballer who said, uh, I never make predictions and I never will. 
which when you think about it, it's a bit weird. Um, but it's an empirical question, this, as to whether or not automation helps employment. Uh, um, uh, as, as James has said, we've got the evidence. Wherever we've done automation, we've ended up making better jobs for more people. We've increased employment. We've brought women into the workforce. We've, we've uh, immensely improved the world. And we've reduced inequality. Because global inequality is going down all the time, as I, as I said before. Uh, so this idea that, 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 that this is all going wrong is not true. And I think it's worth remembering just how dangerous low technology also is. Because there's an idea here that somehow these threats are new because they're coming from high technology. Uh, uh, Tyler mentioned the Holocaust. I've been to Auschwitz. I was, one of the things that struck me was how low tech the whole operation was, how manual in a horrific way, how even by the standards of the 1940s, they weren't using the latest technologies, as it were. You know, it was nothing to do with advances in science. It was old fashioned killing of a horrible kind. We've seen that millions of people killed with machetes in, in, in the last 20 years. Um, uh, and ask yourself this also, do you regard a bottlenose dolphin, probably the most intelligent species on the planet apart from us, maybe including us, uh, do you regard that as a greater threat to us than the Zika virus, which has no intelligence at all? There's no correlation between intelligence and danger uh, in biological systems. Why should there be in artificial systems as well? Um, a lot of this scaremongering is simply based on fiction. That is, to, and I mean that quite literally. I mean that Hal and the Terminator and Frankenstein are looming in the backs of our minds as if these are somehow cautionary tales. They're not. They're made up. <laughs> they're not. They're not true. These these stories. Um, take the technology of blockchain which is the technology behind Bitcoin. And I'm no great fan of Bitcoin. It's a weird thing. But the, but the technology behind it, blockchain, is a brilliant and interesting idea that could cut out the middleman in all sorts of professional occupations, such as signing contracts in business. It could make smart contracts where you don't need accountants and lawyers in the room. My heart bleeds at the thought of that. Sorry about any accountants and lawyers in the room. I say again that this, the, the, the diminution of employment in routine work has been happening to ordinary people at the bottom of society for 100 years and it's all been good. Why should we suddenly panic about it now that it's happening to white collar people? Because that's the difference that's coming. Tyler mentioned in his opening remarks that we're not paying enough attention to the surveillance society. And he's right, that's an issue. But it's not an issue to do with artificial intelligence. Technology has helped dictators and helped people combat dictators um, in different ways for, for decades now. It's not a particular feature of artificial intelligence that we face these problems like whether government should be allowed to look into our lives. There's nothing new about those ideas. They're going to go on being important. And yes, there are going to be horrible things we're going to have to deal with but they're not a particular product of artificial intelligence. Before we go to the, to the next section, I don't know if you would like to answer or to, to, to keep the dialogue between you in, in some issues before I ask the next question. Please, Nick. I could pick up on a couple of things. So one was, uh, uh, Ron, as you were talking about crimes against logic, uh, so to be a little bit more combative. Uh, so Ron had an argument which sounded to me rather like uh, there are these uh, things that could be dangerous, like genetic technology or asteroids, so therefore we shouldn't worry about superintelligence. Uh, that seems to me not to follow, even if it is the case that there might be dangerous things coming from future advances in synthetic biology, that says nothing about the level of risk that might occur uh, if we develop advanced machine intelligence. Um, it's perfectly possible for there to be more than one dangerous thing in the world and for there to be more than one thing that deserves some careful attention and scrutiny. Um, um, picking up on, on Matt Ridley's uh, 
more recent comments, I would agree very strongly that these um, cautionary tales, uh, that's kind of a different context, both from I talked about the, the, the near term, the mid term, and the long term, and then there is the kind of the Hollywood context as well. And, and I agree that that is a big distraction that tends to warp our ability to interpret this. Um, I would say though, with regard to the uh, parallel you drew with the bottleneck dolphin, I don't think that that provides us with any reason to downgrade our estimate of risks from superintelligence. I, it might well be that if you look at why humans have this dominant position on the planet today, it's not because we have stronger muscles or sharper teeth, uh, than other animals, it's our brains were slightly smarter than those of our great ape ancestors. And it's through that we've developed all this technology that now, say, makes the fate of the gorillas depend a lot more on what we do than on what the gorillas do themselves. And it might well be that if you have low levels of intelligence, whether it's uh, the intelligence of a Zika virus or a dog or a bottle nose dolphin, it's all so far below us that those variations don't make a difference in their ability to threaten us. But if you got something that was human level, we do face an entirely different order of threats. Other humans is one of the major threats to humans. And if you got something that was significantly above us, you might then also get an amplified threat. So you wouldn't necessarily see this correlation between levels of intelligence and levels of threat for levels of intelligence that are significantly below humans, because they're all too stupid to be able to invent technologies or do creative things uh, to circumvent our defenses. Just a point of, of, of uh, contest to that slightly, Nick, because I, I don't disagree with it, but actually I think we make the mistake when we say that it was reaching some threshold of individual intelligence that gave us the chance to become the dominant species on the world. The evidence is very clearly that what happened to change us from being just another clever ape on the African savanna to being this world-dominating creature was the networking of our brains, not the individual brains. It's not individual intelligence that enables us to have television cameras and pencils and things like that. It's networked intelligence. Nobody on the planet knows how to make a pencil, as Leonard Reed famously pointed out, because the knowledge is stored in the cloud between individual heads, lots of people with different specialization. So networking of computers is a crucial is a crucial breakthrough, and I do think that the internet, in a sense, is the most intelligent thing that's ever happened. And the old idea that an individual robot, sorry, Ron, um, is going to be our problem here uh, is one we have to get away from. And I think you guys probably are getting away from it. So that's, that, I'll accept that. Uh, just a, a quick comment directly in response. Uh, it seems endemic to the opponents that they don't listen quite as well. Uh, I, I did say in my opening remarks uh, that I am glad that smart people are paying attention, worrying, if you will, uh, about the singularity and superintelligence uh, and the like. So if we're committing crimes of logic, you're committing crimes of not listening. Um, but um, I, my, what I said is, it's a red herring. I said it's distracting us from the real problems that we need to be concerned with. And sure, I'm glad that there's people worrying about alien invasions or asteroids hitting the planet as well, too. But they are not imminent in my mind. Uh, and we need to focus on those things that are causing concerns, causing us uh, issues. Now, you said you are not optimistic about rallying ethical capital. And I would, agree, would have agreed with you 10 or 12 years ago. There were a few of us, almost like voices crying in the wilderness, talking about the potential near and midterm risks associated with artificial intelligence. And very few people were listening, particularly in the context of lethal autonomous weapons. But since that time, and of recently, and almost concurrent with the advances in artificial intelligence, we see, as I mentioned in my talk, the White House, the ICRC, the United Nations, other institutions as well too, even at Oxford. You have a, just a brand new institution stood up that addresses some of these, uh, the longer term concerns certainly. What's that, uh, the, uh, the name of that one? Uh, Strategic Center for the Artificial Intelligence. Yeah. Strategic, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, I could, I mean, so yeah, it is true that there is more uh, attention now than that was even just a few years ago. But it's still, the, so I often travel, you take some car from the airport you arrive in, and maybe it's a half hour drive into the hotel where you're staying. And so you're passing all these office buildings. And 
each one of those office buildings that you're passing by has more people working on something than the sum total of what humanity is allocating to thinking about where AI is going. And what are they all doing? Maybe they are designing a marketing campaign for a new razor blade or something like that. So I think that even though there are more people now than two years ago, there is still far fewer than there should be if the world was the same. But the trend is, encur the trend is encouraging, I would say. That's the, the point I'm trying to make. And from my point of view, there's almost a cacophony of voices. There's too many voices saying too many things on this issue that we can't begin to make sense. And that's why I encourage, in the work that we've done with the ICRC uh, in international humanitarian law, which provides a basis for trying to understand and rally international participation. It shouldn't be scientists, and I don't apologize for being a roboticist. Tyler, a simple question to the three of you. Are any one of you willing to raise your hand and say, yes, I think it would be better for the state of Puebla if all of the jobs in the Ford Motor Plant in Puebla were automated? Will any of you say this? Simple question. I will, over time, yes. Over time, how long? Over time. Well, <laughs> sim similar to we had in previous automations. I'll bet a lot of those, I, I mean, I haven't been inside the Ford factory in Puebla, but I'll, I'll bet you it's got an awful lot of automated machines in it. Of course. Señoras y señores, inteligencia pura. Un aplauso para ellos seis. I would like to very quickly, I mean, this, is, this has been a very complex debate for three reasons. The first one is timing. When we're talking about this topic, it's not the same thing if we talk about the next 10 years, 20 years, or the moment of singularity or superintelligence. And that makes this thing very difficult in a way. Based on that, I would just want to make a very specific question to some of you and to close, of course, with the last remarks that you could have in mind. My biggest concern actually is for the long run, which I don't know when it will happen, but I think it will happen probably sooner than we expect. I don't know. So the first question about out La, la primera pregunta de la automatización and the robotics and all those things that we're debating here, and employment or unemployment, in my particular perspective, are not a debate at all anymore. I think it's a debate of the 19th century, to be honest with you. I mean, as Nick has shown in his book, and many people have already told us, I mean, we know that there have been people that have been, hay gente que ha perdido campeonatos de ajedrez, como Kasparov contra las mejores computadoras o de Jeopardy. Eh, los programas hoy de automatización no son nuevos. Estos son debates a lo mejor hasta desde la revolución industrial. I don't think that's really a debate of today because we have answers for that. Actually, Tyler, this is the first question, is for you. Talking about eh, two things. First, and it has to do with listening. And I think this is very important of what Matt said. And this is the, the most important point, probably philosophical. What's the point? Is the point a consumer? Is the point to create jobs? Is the point that to work is really a fun thing to do? Is because to create a job and be employed means to have a kind of therapy? Or at the end, as Matt said, the point is the consumer. And you could enjoy much more life in a different way because technology will increase your power acquisition in many ways. And my question for you has to do with two things. First, what's the point at the end? And the second one is we cannot compare things with perfection. That's not an issue. You could tell me about the otomy or whatever, but the question is with technology and with advancements, inequality have been there forever, eh? And we still have it, but it's lower today. With the new technologies, are things going to be better or are going to be worse? And secondly, is the point consumption or is the point to create employment? That's the question for you, okay? Matt, I will go very straightforward with you in terms of the question that I want to make you. You, you gave a great explanation of the past and what's been happening, and we were afraid of nanotechnology, and nothing happened, and biogenetics, and nothing happened, and this, and nothing happened, etc. But then comes a point where probably to predict 
the future based on what has happened probably doesn't work. If we really go to superintelligence and we could have a machine that is much more smarter than us, I'm not talking about automatization, I'm talking about a machine that can do many, many things and a machine that actually could learn and actually to create other machines. Forget about the past. Probably now we cannot predict based on the past. Because if we could have that imagination, probably things would be better, probably things would be worse. But it doesn't have anything to do with the prediction of the past. So my question is, if we arrive to that momentum, what could we actually say? OK, that's fine. My, my dear friend, I, I'm concerned, of course, about the question with you will be the same thing about it's not about employment or about inequality. It's in relation with, with what we have today. We have today a lot of inequality, you know? And we have today a lot of automatization. The question is, how come we could create and understand that probably, given the fact that comes another point in time, if things set the disparities, keep this way, the cost of everything will be coming much more or less. So the power of acquisition of the people that have not worked will increase a lot, even that if they work less, like Matt says. So are we debating, thinking on what we have been used to think about the world and the context we are, or imagine that your same concern about equality and employment will be in a different circumstances where the marginal productivity of the people is much more higher and the marginal cost of living is much more lower? That's my question. For you, I mean, you're a lawyer, so I don't want to make your question. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, you're... I, I know. It's worse, Darwin, even. No, I'm just kidding. Again, you talk about 10 and 20 years, and, that's, and, and employment was your, your perspective and things will be better. I, I'm concerned about superhumans. Imagine that that could happen. And I wanted also to make that question to you. Forget about machines. Now we come with humans that instead of having glasses, we have a chip in our brain that is connected to a big, a big a, a nube and, uh, and, and we're really living in a different world. Rights, human rights. We will be humanoids, and other people will be humans, other will be parallel machines. We could get to that point, and I mean, Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and very brilliant people have been aware about these concerns. Try to think about that things. Do you think humanoids should have human rights? Which should, should we have to have respect to these people? What will happen if they go to a, to a if they have an, and have a manifestation and they go to a strike. I mean, could we imagine that the future could be very close in that way? What would be your, would you become much more pessimistic? What would be your point of view? I mean, you're one of the, like all of you, a brilliant brain and it's really an honor to have you here. And I, I'm a big fan of your book. I didn't like the end. I think it lacks like a conclusion, but that's future. My concern is, based on the superintelligence thing, what makes you think that it could not be also a super morality based on the way we could create the program and the algorithm inside the superintelligence thing? I mean, how ca why we cannot create, and even if it is the machine will be smarter than us, and the machine will be smarter, and will create new machines that are smarter. Why smartness is not correlated with moral values? Why smartness machines will be probably evil? I mean, what, what makes you think that? Why not smartness is correlated probably also of and being with a better, nicer, and more ethical thing. And just for you, my last question is, why you think they don't listen? No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs>
It was because I'm not obsessive, I'm not obsessive, I'm not obsessive. No, no, the truth is. If, if you could, in the future, change the mind of the people to understand ethically that things are absolutely different. Today they are different. Today we communicate with smartphones, we're texting all the time, our near relations are very different. Even as Matt said, we have a high tech, but we need conference like this, we're high touch. We need Burning Man, and we need to go to the Rocks football and to the stadium, etc. That's for sure. But imagine that m with most of our time and with the future, our ethical understanding of life, of relations, of love, it's, it's much more related with all these fiction movies of Cyrus and Hare and etc. Could we start thinking of a different ethical values or we're wrong and fix it that what we have always understand as ethical probably is not exactly ethical and in the future could be different, the meaning and the significance of ethics. Do I explain myself? Okay. Señoras y señores, una pregunta. You have at most one minute to answer, and thank you very much. Bas. You ask, what's the point? The point is maintaining and building a stable democracy that requires a stable middle class, and that requires manufacturing jobs. So I do worry about automation. And Matt's long run, in which Puebla is better off by all those jobs disappearing, that is a very long run indeed. Now, we know from economics, any job you create, over time, it will disappear. It will become obsolete. But there is an optimal speed at which jobs disappear and turn into other jobs. You can have too much change in a way that is straining the social fabric. And if you look at today's world, with its Brexit vote, with Le Pen in France, with the election of Donald Trump in my country, and ask yourself the simple question, you know, might it possibly be the case that change right now is coming more quickly than the ethical, social, and political fabric can handle? I think you have to say the very good chance the answer to that is yes, and that's my worry. Andres says that uh, the future is going to be different from the past. We can't extrapolate from what happened in the past. And I'm reminded of a quote by the historian Thomas Babington Macaulay. Why is it that with nothing but improvement behind us, we are to expect nothing but deterioration before us? This is a common human habit to always accept and take for granted the improvements of the past and expect deterioration in the future. We're always doing it. We're constantly being pessimistic about the future. It doesn't mean the, past is going to, the future is going to be the same as the past. It's not. It's going to be different uh, in, in all sorts of ways. But in this case, we can actually envisage, imagine, the future we're talking about, a future in which automation and, and artificial intelligence pr provides many of our needs, and we can see that actually that's a world in which people live more fulfilled lives, consuming more, and yes, go out and find live events and go and hire yoga teachers and things like that as well. So I think there's every reason to think that actually the future is likely to be good. Muy bien. Muy bien. So we can assume that automation will eliminate a lot of jobs, perhaps, or maybe drive wages down as it descales jobs. But at the same time, of course, it's going to make production more efficient and everything cheaper. So won't that mean that everything works out? I think not. Uh, for one thing, many of the most important expenses that we face, for example, housing, are much less susceptible to, autumn, to this effect because you can't manufacture a new land. The same is true of costs like healthcare and education so far in the US as well. But a more important uh, issue is that historically, the path to prosperity has been that the cost of everything has actually increased in nominal terms, but wages have increased more. Uh, what you're discussing now is actually the, the opposite of that, where you've got wages collapsing and costs collapsing. That's a deflationary scenario. I don't think you would find many economists who would advocate that as the path to prosperity in the future. One thing that would happen is that people wouldn't be able to pay their debts, for instance, and you would quickly get into a financial crisis. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. So thinking about rights of humanoids, uh, we actually 
have a, a very close problem to, similar to that today where in many states rights are being extended to animals. Um, and and it's, I think it's very controversial and I'm not sure where I stand on the issue. But understand the logic there. That the reason rights are getting extended to animals is because humans care a lot about animals. Humans project human emotions on animals. And I think that's this, in a sense the same issue or a concern, a framework for thinking about how we want to think about uh, rights for humanoids. But the question is, why would we want to replace humans with uh, humanoids in order to have personal interaction? Uh, I think there's a real economic question whether that's a good idea. And I think maybe there's a philosophical question that we don't want to create uh, the, these vehicles and then want to have to extend rights to them. Uh, and, and so I think there may be an important difference there. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Um, whether superintelligence implies super morality, uh, I think the answer is unfortunately no. We see even within the realm of different human beings that there is no necessary correlation. You have very smart people who are uh, very evil uh, and very uh, dumb people who are very nice, and you have all possible combinations, right? The space of AIs is even much larger than that. In principle, you could have a very powerful instrumental intelligence that is very good at figuring out which actions will have what consequences, which plans will lead to what outcomes, and then apply that in pursuit of virtually any goals. The criterion by which you select one action rather than another is kind of independent from the mechanism that enables you to find plans that achieve those goals. And, and that's really why we face this big challenge to solve the control problem uh, that we will maybe have a few decades to solve, but at some point when we solve the intelligence problem, we will have to have solved it. Thank you. With respect to, I, as I interpreted, ethical adequacy for the analysis of the changes that we're undergoing, We've had ethical frameworks around for thousands of years, uh, and some more recent as well, too. Consequentialism and deontology, rights-based versus outcome-based approaches, uh, going way back, virtue ethics. All of these are currently being used in the context of analyzing the impact that these systems will have. A newer versions of ethics have emerged, such as feminist ethics, which have not been applied in this particular context. But speaking to the question of intimate robotics, which is an area I actually am very concerned with uh, and written about, um, as well. Uh, it's in a very important topic. It's an issue of whether, and as I stated in the opening, uh, disrupt uh, with the social fabric uh, as a consequence uh, of that. Movies like Ex Machina and Her and the series Westworld address that. I've worked with Sony on Ivo for 10 years, finding ways to embed and have patents on robot emotions with scare quotes uh, there as well too, to foster attachment to these objects. There's real deep questions that remain unresolved and we need to find the ethical mecha mechanisms to do that. Señoras y señores, un aplauso a esta gran capacidad intelectual de estas seis personas admirable. Brevemente, por favor, la luz. Alguien de ustedes cambió de voto y pensaba que esto era muy malo y probablemente estaban equivocados. Solo una persona, alguien cambió de voto al revés. Una vez más, la prueba es muy clara. No buscamos la verdad, sino reforzar nuestros prejuicios. Para eso son los debates. Pero probablemente sirva no creernos todo lo que pensamos. Despidamos con un fuerte aplauso. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Please. Quédense, por favor. Queremos hacer una breve sorpresa. Dos minutos, dos minutos. Por favor, quédense con nosotros en lo que salen. Este es un momento muy importante. Muy, muy breve. No les quitamos más que cinco minutos, pero quisiera yo eh, hacer un reconocimiento y invitar, si me lo permite, don Ricardo Sánchez Pliego, subir aquí con nosotros al, al estrado. Señoras y señores, México vive a veces por... De, no solo México, cumplimos años, aniversarios, etcétera, y nosotros nos preocupa, nos preocupa realmente hacer las cosas en función de tiempo. La temporalidad, Ricardo, de estos últimos seis años, desde que nuestro muy querido gobernador Rafael Moreno Valle nos apoyó y creyó en esto, nos obliga, y lo estamos platicando, a hacer un reconocimiento que nunca hemos hecho muy formal de gratitud, 
en relación a, a la visión que él ha tenido. Quisiéramos darle una sorpresa al gobernador, por ende. Así es, a nuestro gran amigo Rafael, que es un, una persona con una gran capacidad, que hemos visto todo lo que ha hecho por Puebla en la cuestión eh, física. Es de veras una, pues un placer visitar la ciudad y ver que cada día hay más progreso de mejores calles, el concreto, los puentes, los parques. Eh, y, y es muy imp impresionante el contraste con otros estados donde lo único que hay son problemas y, este, y desviaciones. Así que eh, esa parte es la visible, pero esta otra parte de la ciudad de las ideas yo creo que es muy importante también porque las ideas tienen consecuencias y yo estoy seguro que los miles y miles de personas que han venido aquí y que se han enriquecido con estas ideas van a ser un activo importantísimo no nada más para Puebla, sino para todo México. De manera que queremos hacerle un reconocimiento muy especial a Rafael por haber apoyado eh, la Ciudad de las Ideas durante todos estos años. Rafael se va a retirar próximamente de la gubernatura, pero estoy seguro que tendrá un brillante panorama por delante. Entonces, con la placa de Dios se salga. ¡Bravo! Con señor gobernador, si nos acompaña. Eh, es... Es, es un honor porque, sobre todo yo sé en tiempos donde la política no se aplaude, pero la gente que apuesta en ideas se ha creído en estos proyectos. Esto es algo simbólico, se va a hacer algo muy grande, donde va a venir en cada uno de los años que usted nos apoyó, quiénes participaron, qué pasó, cuál fue el tema. Esto es simplemente algo simbólico, pero no queríamos dejar de de, de verdad de agradecerte de corazón que hayas apostado, hayas tenido la visión, nos hayas apoyado en muchos de los conferencistas, de las ideas, que fuiste parte intelectual de este proyecto. No tenemos palabras todos nosotros para agradecerte de corazón. Muchas gracias. No sé si... Esto es simbólico, porque apenas aquí dice reconocimiento al señor Rafael Moreno Valle, gobernador constitucional de Listo Puebla, por su invaluable apoyo a lo largo de estos seis años para ser de Puebla un referente internacional de ideas innovadoras, ciencia y conceptos adelantados a nuestro tiempo por el Festival Internacional de Mentes Brillantes, la ciudad de las ideas por seis años. Un aplauso, por favor. Prenda la luz, por favor. Si puede prender la luz. Pues muchísimas gracias a todos. Esta será la última edición en la que participe como gobernador, pero estoy convencido que es un proyecto que merece continuidad y por supuesto que para mí la mayor satisfacción de haber tenido el más alto honor al que puede aspirar un poblano es precisamente haber recuperado nuestro orgullo. Muchísimas gracias a todos. ¡Bravo! Stand ovation, él se merece un stand ovation, por favor. Gracias.